Hi there, welcome to this, um, the second video on the channel of a disappointed man, and I am the disappointed man, Jason Kennedy. And first of all, a big thank you to everyone who um, viewed my last um, video, and particularly to the to the new subscribers. Now, my subscriber count has leapt from um, seven to a scarcely imaginable 10 and so I've now set myself um, my next target which is to reach 11 subscribers um, by the end of the year so if you'd like to press the red button and make it happen that would be um, much appreciated and I did also receive a piece of feedback which was that the last video was too quiet uh, one person said Jason you're whispering like Ted Lowe doing the snooker so I'll be doing my best to be louder today and I'm actually going to model myself on the drill instructor from Full Metal Jacket for this video. So if I begin screaming at some point and calling you all maggots, um, that will be the reason why. So the, um, the purpose of today's video is to talk about um, two novels I recently finished, and they are James Hanley Boy, um, 1931, and Hangover Square, Patrick Hamilton, 1940. Now, Patrick Hamilton scarcely needs an introduction. He's best known today for um, the term gaslighting, which is taken from his uh, play Gaslight and he also wrote a play called Rope which was turned into a, um, an amazing movie by Alfred Hitchcock. James Hanley is less well known in the introduction to this um, edition. Anthony Burgess says that he's uh, one of that class of neglected genius which one finds in, um, in the history of English literature and he files him um, alongside um, two other writers um, who've suffered a similar fate. One of them, I've got his books here, William Sansom, certainly um, pretty much unknown today. And also Rex Warner, who I've got his books over there. Um, he wrote a great novel called The Aerodrome. Now, I will talk about Sansom and Warner um, in a later video. Um, Warner, I would say, um, is um, someone who, J.G. Ballard, let's be, uh, how can I, how may I, how may I say this? J.G. Ballard was a keen student of Rex Warner's methods and they're very evident in the fiction of J.G. Ballard. So if you like J.G. Ballard, you would certainly appreciate Rex Warner and his standout novel is The Aerodrome. It was made into a TV um, series at some point too. William Sansom, it's a little different. These are just very, very curious stories told in a very strange fashion possibly more um, linked with an artist like Kafka. As for James Hanley, how would I situate him if I was going to say um, which writers might um, might lead you to James Hanley or you might appreciate his work um, having read them? Um, usually compared to Conrad because he w writes about the, the, um, the sea um, you know, um, a lot in his work. To me, that's not the best comparison. Um, I did not really see this when I was reading um, Boy. I would say that a writer like Nut Hans Hamsen, um, if you enjoyed reading Hunger, then you will enjoy this as well. It um, has certain similarities in the how simple um, the language um, it uses is. And um, the way its power derives, not from not from a, a um, from the richness of its language, but more about um, the force that develops um, from the rhythm of the writing. Uh, it's it's very um, there's a great economy here, uh, but everything's been um, refined, everything's been honed to a point, and that lends it um, its power. That's where its power derives from. It doesn't really have any rhetorical power. Okay, so Boy was very controversial when it was first published because of its explicit um, scenes of homosexuality, uh, which are central um, to the story. Uh, what is this story? Well, if we begin with the title, Boy, that is the uh, one of the key ideas in this text, is that um, the central figure's individuality is never properly acknowledged um, by by really by anyone else in the in the book everyone else uses their own conception of what a boy is as their as their standard okay so boy is the first thing he is called by the schoolmaster in the opening scene and boy is the last word that resounds in his ears in the moments preceding his death 
um, at the tender age of 16. So rather than the standard um, Buildings Roman, where you'll see, um, you'll follow the development of the, um, of the central figure, this is a kind of anti-Buildings Roman, so it opens with the door being shut on a better life for Arthur when he learns that um, he, has, he, he has to disclose to his teacher that he's not going to be able to stay on at school even though he's a bright student uh, because his parents are demanding that he um, is released from his studies at the age of 14 so he can begin working on the docks and contributing um, to the household in that way. So he is taken away from, from school life and um, prepared for his um, life in, the, uh, in his new job. And the household scenes are where we're first introduced to the violence that will punctuate um, the boy's narrative with um, alarming frequency. And his father beats him so savagely that the mother is terrified that he's going to go too far and actually kill him. And it's left open, but there's the suggestion that um, Arthur has suffered some kind of serious injury, perhaps a, um, a neurological injury from this beating, because he begins to have strange health episodes later in moments of stress. He'll begin to exhibit um, strange behavior that will alarm those um, those who witness it. So um, he takes his job in the docks and you have a scene there where he's um, he's very small so he's cleaning inside the um, the boilers and it's filthy dangerous work and there there is another scene of, of violence where um, some of the older boys try to initiate Arthur and there's some kind of sexual assault that takes place on him. Um, it's it's described in a way where it's more suggestive of what's happening and um, that kind of increases its power that you're not sure of the contents of this scene, of the precise details. And it's broken up by a, a supervisor happening to wander past. And after a week or so of this um, environment, Arthur realizes that he's not going to be able to survive in this world and one of the boys plants the seed which germinates um, in Arthur's mind of stowing away on a ship and so this becomes his plan and the basic motivation is um, whatever happens after he stows away cannot be worse than um, a lifetime of toil in the um, in the Merseyside docks so he does this and there's a kind of death and rebirth um, trope here, which is very familiar um, from all kinds of adventure narratives. You find it in uh, Moonfleet when the um, the boy um, spends a, um, uh, an, an extended period in a cave and when he emerges, suddenly he, he finds that he's a man. Or in The Lost World by Conan Doyle where Ned falls into the dinosaur trap after going for a kind of midnight ramble. Through, um, through the Lost World, and, and while there he has the chance to kind of recalibrate his, um, the kind of person he, he should be in future uh, in order not to have a repeat of, um, of that incident. So here, the death and rebirth is um, like a rebirth into hell, because what happens afterwards on the ship is appalling. Um, every kind of abuse um, that you can suffer. So it's psychological, physical, and um, particularly sexual abuse is um, Arthur's fate as a boy, because here the term boy comes into its own on board ship, because for the men on board, this is the great distinction. It's not between homosexuality and um, heterosexuality, which is uh, quite interesting how they're presented. It's between men and boys. And boys are responsible for all the problems in the world. And um, everything that goes wrong can be attributed to a boy. And a boy shouldn't have any um, trace of um, individuality. He should simply um, do and be and uh, be at the beck and call of these men and in particular um, a boy should provide sexual services um, and should be willing to 
provide them. And these men, these sailors, kind of lament the passing of the golden age of sodomy on the high seas. And so they talk of when each sailor used to have a compliant boy um, that they could use, and they would call them a, a brownie. And the idea is that they can restart the tradition of a brownie with um, Arthur in the vanguard. Now, Arthur knows a little bit about the world, and so he fights off these um, unwanted advances with his um, fists and with whatever he can find to hand. And he appeals to the officers who take a dim view and seek to protect him from any further um, um, trouble with the men. Um, but one um, point um, in, in terms of the, the theme here is the way it deals with homosexuality is not the usual way where it would be in tension with masculinity. For the sailors, there's no problem with um, expressing that they have a sexual preference for boys over women. It does nothing to um, um, challenge their, their masculinity, whereas we'll see it's a very different story in um, Hangover Square. Um, Arthur has his own sexual awakening, and this is um, happens when he um, goes on shore leave. Now here there's an, a very interesting split, because these same men who've been attempting to um, have their way with Arthur, when it comes to shore leave, they turn into these kind of maiden aunts, warning him away from all the, uh, the dangers of women and urging him not to go into the, into the, uh, the quarter of the, of the, of the port of this eastern city where all of the uh, ladies of the night um, ply their trade and um, except for one man who um, for some reason seems to enjoy the thought of um, initiating Arthur into the mysteries of um, sex and takes Arthur along um, to an encounter with one of these women and he has Arthur watch him um, do the deed and then um, suggests that Arthur takes a turn. But instead, Arthur, Arthur has a turn, and there's some kind of seizure that he has, and this um, shakes up the, the sailor, and he takes him back quickly to the boat. Now, word gets around the boat of what's happened, and efforts are redoubled to stop Arthur from, um, from going back and um, sampling the pleasures of these, uh, of these uh, women. But he is intent on escaping, and he does. And he tries to find the same woman, but instead he's waylaid by a, another um, prostitute. And she um, has sex with him and takes his um, virginity there. And this seals his fate, this moment of um, pleasure, because he contracts um, a case of syphilis. And when this comes to light a few weeks later, um, the ship's steward, who's um, attended similar cases, recommends that um, the best thing for Arthur is to do away with himself. And he urges him to um, simply toss himself overboard and, and put an end to his life. And um, although he doesn't do this, um, his, his, um, his demise is not, not far off. And it's passed off as um, a man falling um, overboard. Now, having said that, um, the obvious question arises of why would anyone really want to read this book uh, when it's so unrelentingly grim? It has to be said there's um, almost, I don't think there's any humour whatsoever. Um, there's some na naivety, um, as, as you'd expect, um, in, the, in the thoughts and, and, and actions of a, of a young boy. So you could say that there's a a small charm there, but it's more a kind of poignancy in terms of um, the fate that befalls Arthur. But my answer on, on thinking about it was the um, the the force of um, of this of the narration is what distinguishes this book. It's told with um, great economy, and it doesn't moralize. It doesn't try to achieve its aims through any um, flights of um, rhetoric. It's very simple language with which it's done, but it's powerful. Um, it reminded me in some ways of um, Gissing as well, George Gissing, whose works kind of accumulate their power as they move forwards quite slowly until when you reach the, um, the second half of a Gissing novel, you'll often feel this kind of um, the crushing weight upon you of this um, unfolding drama. It's not quite as um, worked out as that because it's done in a more spare way, but it, it certainly um, gathers force like a storm 
as you make your way through it. And I think it's the way there's this careful blending together of um, the nautical aspects. It's not like one of these Patrick O'Brien fictions where you learn how to rig out a schooner or something like this, but the sounds of the ship and the way they are carefully um, sort of spliced into the um, action. And sometimes they're the backdrop to discussions which have no connection with what's happening um, in terms of the um, the ship's progress, but sometimes they're also they um, are the focus of the of the discourse too, such as when there's bad weather or or something to attend to, and um, it's more authentic in that way, I believe, than Captain's Courageous, which I talked about last time, and also the dialogue is is particularly um, strong, and the reason I said that there's no real uh, credence given to rhetoric in this novel is that when the characters themselves engage in sort of brief bursts of rhetoric it does amount to um, bluster ultimately and, and other characters will will even as, as they engage in their own flights when they when they refer to someone else's flight they will just knock it down and say oh you know it's a pile of balls it's just wind it's just who why you listen to that old duffer is he trying to get into your into your uh, into your trousers as well so it doesn't make its point in that way um but it does make its point it's a, it's a it's an excellent read even if it is extremely bleak that is boy by james handling now the next one hangover square i'll be a little bit more brief because i can't um go into the um the story quite so much because there is a suspense element to it so it would be considered um, a spoiler. Let's just talk about the formal similarities with Boy then. So the the first one would be the the um, it's the third person omniscient narration which they both share. Um, but that works in a very interesting way in um, in um, Hangover Square because there it begins with the word click. Just as Boy begins with Boy, this one begins with the important word click, and here the click is something happening in the mind of the central figure who is um, George Herbert Bone, who's this big um, nobody, basically. He's some kind of failure um, by his own admission. And this click signifies his switching between um, a normal state of engagement with the world and a kind of schizoid state in which he feels as if it's described really well. I'm not going to um, read directly from it, but you will see that there's this submarine quality to his experiences with the um, in this other world of these episodes. And the key the key fact here is there's two is firstly, um, he doesn't know when he emerges from the schizoid state what he's been doing or thinking while he was in them. So he has absolutely no knowledge. So there'll be moments in the narrative where suddenly he wakes up, he just comes back to his senses and he's somewhere else. Um, it may be in a, in a town that he doesn't know or there are things in his pockets that he's got no idea how they got there and he doesn't know how long he's been in that state for. So that's very um, unsettling. Even more unsettling is the content of the states because inside the schizoid state he's um, fixated on um, committing a murder of um, a woman called Netta and this is a woman that he has become infatuated with and so um, when he's in his normal state and interacting with Netta there is the unreliable um, narrator aspect of this where you can't really be sure that Netta is sending out the kinds of signals which he claims that she is. And some of these descriptions are of a paranoid nature. So, for example, he's got this belief that Netta emits some kind of rays which you can feel the presence of at a distance. And he says that they even extend from her house to um, a corner of the street. So he can stand on a corner of the street and he can dimly feel these waves. Now, even though he's not in the schizoid state when he's reporting this, it still fits with um, accounts 
of um, schizophrenics and I, um, one thing if, if you're not aware of it maybe I'll put a link below is there's this idea of the influencing machine that someone wrote a very famous paper about and these are reports that um, schizophrenics will make of um, complex machinery which is being used to influence them and so they will be able to draw these kind of Rube Goldberg uh, diagrams of how they work and they'll know if they've been switched on because they will feel the hum and suddenly they've come under the influence. Now, of course, it's just a product of their own imagination. So we can't absolutely be sure that um, some of what Netta um, is doing is really um, her intention or is even happening at all. So that part of it is, um, is quite um, interesting. And the milieu in which they um, all move is kind of um, seedy um, London scene. And um, Patrick Hamilton is particularly noted as the kind of patron saint of writing about boozers. And um, he treats boozing and pubs. Pubs are like churches and boozing is like worship. And a, a pub is kind of even better than a church because not only can you uh, you can you can drink at the same time as you uh, as you kind of you can worship the grape there and um, he's also got this sense that every pub has kind of got its own unique vibrations and not just uh, because of their location but at certain times of the day so there may be even kind of poetical moments when the light is entering through a through an open door into a saloon bar and um, creating a, a particular um, ambiance. So if you like uh, drinking, it's uh, it's quite amusing. And if you simply keep track of the prodigious quantities of alcohol that are consumed over the course of Hangover Square, that is uh, in its in itself um, and a source of unintended, perhaps source of entertainment. Now, <clears throat> the suspense element. Yes, um, I'm not going to um, spoil this for you. But what I will say is um, just a couple of things about why you might read this. Now, um, more so than uh, than James Handley, whose um, whose style tends towards um, his his um, art tends towards a kind of um, lack of a strong narrative um, voice. Um, in terms of you don't really feel that there's a you don't really sense a person behind the um the narration in his um in his um story with Patrick Hamilton that is um very different there is um a curious offbeat black humor at work in the narration it's not at the level of the characters because they don't crack any jokes they're not particularly funny um, they're more sarcastic, they're more caustic, but there is a kind of rhythm or a cadence or a, or a kind of repetition. There's just a, um, a style all of his own inside Patrick Hamilton. The trains along which his um, thought runs, um, the rails along which his thought runs is, um, is quite unique to him. And um, that is certainly one of the pleasures of reading Hangover Square. And the other thing I, I want to say is that um, all the things that make um, a novel good, all of the techniques that uh, a writer would have to master to produce compelling um, novels, compelling works of art, Patrick Hamilton has mastered them. He is a superb craftsman and that is one of the reasons he can undertake like the difficult challenge of um of producing um suspense which is not not easy to um to manufacture and the way this pushes forward towards its dreadful um conclusion is gripping it's um really truly well done now the other formal thing i thought was quite curious is that both of these novels end with the death of the central figure and also the deaths are announced in, in similar ways. In this one, it's done in a telegraphic kind of manner with um, a communication sent from the ship to the, um, to the authorities recording, you know, that um, Arthur Fear, an ordinary seaman, age 16, has been lost overboard, presumed drowned. And in this one, his death is um, reported in just a couple of words. In, um, a, in in a newspaper, and that is his like he's just a footnote 
to history, you know, um, and that's it. So in both of these, you get the idea that these are tales that the, um, the, the central figure would not be able to produce themselves, that only someone from the outside can kind of represent these lives that are not considered valuable um, by um, society um, at large. So yes, in here, of course, Arthur's de death at 16, there would be, there's no one to tell the story. Um, only the narrator can take it upon themselves to piece this together. And likewise with this, you know, there's the same sense that it's um, somewhat unimportant who's being made the focus of a literary work. Um, so that's another thing they share in common. Now, I think I've said enough about them. Um, I hope this hasn't been um, too rambling. And if you've made it this far, I do thank you. But I'm going to stop now and I will see you for the next video. Okay, until the next time, Nanu Nanu.